First, I'm going to show you some past work um, and kind of give you a feeling for the procedure, especially for the artists who are here, um, some of the process for, for commissions. I've been um, really doing public art since 1994. Before that, I was a sculptor. Before that, I was actually a printmaker and a book artist. Um, and um, when I look at my work since then, I, I see that every piece is different, formally different, but there are all these things that they have in common, and there, there are these threads. So some of the threads are um, that I often crowdsource content, and I'll talk about all these things as I show you the work. Um, I often use text and signage and the influence of literature, so it's really interesting to me that there's writers in the group. Um, I use generative procedures often, um, not in the project that we're in, in Austin, but that's been something I've been doing since I've been making sculpture, and that kind of grows out of the text and, and um, literature influence. Um, I do, when it comes to site specificity, I don't like the term placemaking. I sort of think of it as space making, like I'll make a space somewhere. Placemaking has sort of gotten to have bad connotations now um, in that it sometimes refers to gentrification or you know, um, someone coming in from the outside and altering a place. Um, and finally, I like to mix digital with mechanical. Uh, so I'm going to show you, start with this nice picture of an I-beam. Um, I'm going to show you a bunch of pieces and show you the process, uh, a bit of the process, some before pictures. So this is a before picture of a piece um, that I was commissioned to make in Minneapolis. Oh, I'm just going to hold it for you. You're going to hold it? Yeah. Really? Yeah, you can talk. No, I'll hold it. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's just too silly. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I was commissioned to make a piece in Minneapolis in 2000. And at the time, they said, make a media piece, an interactive media piece for 11 stations of the light rail. And it was a big commission. And I thought, how am I going to make an outdoor media piece? Um, one of the things I was thinking about for this was site specificity, because they always tell you, you know, go and meet the community. Um, and I go to Minneapolis, and there's so many communities of people. There's so many kinds of people. It's, each station has a different neighborhood. It went all the way to the airport from downtown. Um, so I just started asking people who I met, which was a sort of small sampling, well, tell me about Minnesota. And to a person, they said, everybody talks about the weather. And there's this cliche about everybody being really nice. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'm just, they seem to love their cliches. There's no way I'm going to become a Minnesotan in this short amount of time. And this is something I've taken with me, um, is that I don't feel like I can, I can get to know the place. So I try to make things situation specific, and I try to let the content, to a certain extent, come out of the place. So I had a competition. And if you go to the bottom, it says the two themes, all materials should be related in some way to one of the two cliches about Minnesota, the weather or courtesy. Um, and this was a um, eligibility, any resident in Minnesota. I commissioned 100 Minnesotans to make about 200 pieces. Um, and then it wasn't artists necessarily. It was all kinds of people, weather buffs, etiquette experts, anyone with a good story to tell. And it turned out that there, were so, there was so much good content. Um, I made spreadsheets, which is what I do all the time. Um, uh, of the different people, what I paid them, did I, at the time in 2000, between 2000 and 2004, um, people were sending, you know, uh, little cassettes, there, what, I don't, you know, CDs, they, people were sending me stuff in the mail. It's quite different, now. it would have been so much easier now. Um, and then I heard an, uh, I've, skipped, I've left some slides out, but I hired an industrial design company to make these boxes and an AV company, both in New York, to, to uh, plan the AV. Um, and this is just the only installation shot of this I'm showing, but here are some of the pieces. So the piece is called Small Kindness as Weather Permitting. 
Um, they started out with, um, I think it started with 35 of these kiosks. All, they were kind of in an addition of four each, three or four. Um, so there'd be three or four different <coughs> ones at each of the 11 stations. Now there's 24 uh, of them left, um, 15 years later. Um, this, there's a little plaque a on each of them. It says, small kindness is weather permitting with a number. They're numbered. And then it, it says something like that. says, turn the wheel or, or something like that. And so you turn this wheel. There's glass. The windshield wiper wipes the inside of the glass, and it triggers the next video. But what you don't get from this picture is that the, it's the content that's really great from the Minnesotans. This is a video about ice fishing. If you sit at each video kiosk, they're consecutive, so you'll see all 100, which would take a couple hours. But um, no one does, because they're just waiting for their train. So they get on the light rail, and the next day they'll see something else. Um, some of them are just audio. It was just a chance to play with crazy mechanical things, too. So this says, hit the bell, I think, um, and then an audio piece. So it'll be a song or a poem or any number of things. And everyone's identified. They say their name afterwards, and they in the videos, their name is posted afterwards. Uh, this says, Yank the Handle Thanks. This was a Native American artist, um, writer, actually. He's since passed away, um, named Jim Northrup. Um, and it's excerpts from a video about him. Um, this is a uh, guy named Lauren Nimi. It says, uh, open the curtains, please. So you slide that and the curtain opens and closes and you get the next video. So there are a lot of spoken word artists in Minneapolis and Minnesota and a lot of them are filmed like this, spoken word. Um, go ahead and let it snow. So that's an audio one. Here's another, go ahead and let it snow. So we just put different things in the snow globes. Um, that shows you the context to a certain extent. Um, pick up the phone. Uh, this is another pinball. The pinballs always get stuck. Um, so this was the first design that I did because I was looking at my doorbell in Brooklyn and I took the cover off and there was that crazy thing. So um, this one says ring the bell and see. So if you ring the bell, it goes ding dong, you know, that thing. And then you look through the hole and you're freezing in Minnesota and you see that. <laughs> so, and this was a thanks a million. It actually only goes up to 999, um, So there you can see the plaque a little better. Um, and kids love them and play with them a lot. And um, so, uh, that brings me to this guy, whose name is Joe Scala. This is another one of the first one I showed you. Um, so since nobody had thought about maintenance, um, I was thinking, well, these things are going to break. What am I going to do? And you know, I talked to the light rail people, and they said, well, we'll go out and fix them when they break, you know, after your warranty is over. So I was standing on the platform saying, like, how will we know if one is broken? And this fellow, Joe Scala, was unemployed at the time, um, but he was sort of a train buff, so he was really interested in what was happening on the light rail. And he said, I'll check them every week. And I said, really? And, <laughs> and uh, sure enough, for the past 15 years, with a few exceptions, Joe Scala has been checking them every week. He's also, here, I think this is 2009 and 10, um, and he sends a spreadsheet, and um, he's since been, well, actually for many years now, been employed by the light rail um, as a, in an office job. So that's good. I feel like somehow this got him his job. And this is one of his emails. So he always says Dateline, wherever he happens to be, Minneapolis Central Library, and then which ones are working and which ones aren't. So without him, he's, you know, he is the hero of public art as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, so that's that piece. I, Going a little slowly, but I'm going to try to zip through a few more to give you a few more themes. Another theme is this idea of language gen and, and the generative and the mechanical and the digital, sort of mixing a few themes here. So here's the installation of also one of my earliest pieces, um, also commissioned in 2000 and I think installed in 2002. Um, this was for a technology school in New Mexico. Um, 
so I wanted to make something both mechanical and digital. I wanted it to have uh, digital, I was interested in like digital input, mechanical output. And I still like that idea. So I found the, um, oh, I found the manufacturers of the flippy signs, the railroad flippy signs, and I had this very long one made and here they are installing it. And then I wrote a program, um, a language generating program. Ah, is my time up? <laughs> and um, here's the program. I had a good friend who's a programmer and he wrote me, the only program I really knew was BASIC from the 80s. So, um, hmm. so he wrote an interface that kind of looks like BASIC for me and um, in Java is a little bit perverse, but he made a basic. <laughs> so then I could write my program in basic and it would, these, these sentences would come up. And the way that I would write language generating programs is that I would um, do it the dumb way, not the smart way. Like I didn't teach the computer to know grammar. I just gave it a huge vocabulary and a whole lot of structures. And then I just tested it and tested it and tested it. And I used sort of local uh, language too. So there's some New Mexico language in there. So these are some of those sample sentences. Um, there will be a giant phone call on the way. Um, and then the way it works is that, oh, it's down now, by the way, it's been taken down, but because the school has been, uh, this area of the school is closed. But the way it worked was that the door, the mechanical door triggered it, um, triggered a, a, the computer that was back behind, it would write a new sentence. So these sentences are written f for you as you enter. Um, and then it would go flip, 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 and it would give you this. Um, so there's the flipping, you can kind of see it. Um, and this is me um, looking up at it because this was one of the first things it said, which just seemed ridiculously impossible. Um, and this is actually the dean, and it said this to him. Well, it said, it said many things to him, but it, I captured this on. Um, so sometimes it's a little moody and poetic. Um, sometimes it talks about itself and its own processes, language and cognitive science. Sometimes it's naughty. This is another naughty one. And it can be political. So would this show up again? That Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Not exactly. Like it might say, you know, their structures. So it might say uh, this something is, you know, verb with, you know, noun, whatever, right? So, and it might repeat. I, I can't say it would never repeat. Certain structures would repeat maybe more. Like, I think I had come on into as an introduction in one of the structures. This one's kind of, some people would walk in and say, what's that supposed to mean? You know, people really take these things as like fortune cookies. <laughs> I like it when it's a little da-da. Um, so something like go out and multiply is probably a phrase, I'm guessing. You know, this was a long time ago that I wrote this, but. Yeah. Oh, I think I already showed this, did I? Um, okay, and then it kept a log of every sentence it wrote. Um, so you can see how it's not repeating. You know, some of them are, obviously, I picked ones that weren't quite as Dada as others, but they all make sense. This is his own arm that the teacher stroked. That's really bad. <laughs> I didn't even notice that one. <laughs> See, that's the same structure. It says, that was your hair clip that the witness fondled. Just analyzing it here. <laughs> okay, so then I went um, many years later, I think, 10 years later, 2012, I got a commission at an engineering school in Florida. 
And they said, can you make that same thing? And I said, no, but, <laughs> but um, I'll make another language generating machine. And this is a project that I actually lost money on. It was so, so complicated to make, and you know, I didn't plan to lose money on it, but it was just really R&D, because we built the mechanical parts ourselves. And I say ourselves, but you know, I hired people to do it. Um, this is a rendering. Um, the idea was to use lips. Well, the idea was that it came from the fact that engineering schools are about 90% male. So I wanted to do something about gender. Um, so you know, lipsticks go in and out. So I thought that could be pixels. Um, and here's the, it, it was much shorter. It's bigger and shorter. So I used the same idea for language generating, but um, the sentences are all shorter. So this probably does repeat. Um, wow, that's interesting. Um, uh, so I, the way I uh, generated the sentences, you can, actually this one shows my lexicon too, so it gives you a little clue of, you know, different kinds of nouns, different kinds of articles, that kind of thing. Um, uh, I used the language of engineering, which is kind of sexual, and the language of beauty advertisement, which is kind of engineery. Um, so, you know, because like, you know, microdermabrasion and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so um, somehow the two, I had to look at a lot of beauty magazines, which was really not fun. Um, but I put those two things together. One of the reasons I lost money on this is that we cast the lipsticks ourselves out of resin. It was fun, but not cost effective. This was the little test of one of the modules with an Arduino. This is the um, shop that built the machine, the parts, and putting it all together. Here it is saying sexy something, um, but notice that you can't really read it. And then we put a cover on it um, and lighting above it, and that made all the difference. You could see you know, the light bounced off the lipstick faces. This is the side of it installed. Um, this is installing it, men doing things in me on the phone. And <laughs> thank you, Kim. <laughs> um, and here's a few things that it said. New sprocket, new you. Okay, I'm going to skip this project. Uh, you can see it on my website. Uh, da, 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 da seasons pass and go right to oops what happened go right to this one um, so I was this is a before picture I was commissioned um, to do a piece in Kansas City uh, and um, it was for the park a parking garage six flights up and it could be inside the parking garage but then we went up on top of the parking garage and noticed this sort of weird park that no one went to because it was just so barren. And, but it is a green roof. Um, and it kind of piqued my interest and, and got me interested in green roofs. Um, this is the green roof, but it was just sad at the time. Open to the public. Um, and um, then I noticed uh, that there were trains everywhere in Kansas City, in north and south, and prairie. and. Um, the public art manager, Porter O'Neill, was really great and said, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to build something and put it on the top of a roof. You're going to want a design build team, sort of like Blue Genie. Um, and uh, so y you should meet these architects, El Dorado, and this is one of the El Dorado people, Dan McGinn, who I work closely with. Um, and we looked at a lot of trains and sort of had crazy ideas together. This is a rendering of a prairie with a train. Um, it was a breakthrough to think, like I thought, okay, we'll put a train on the roof. Let's make it go around in a circle. You know, I, I wasn't happy with just making a thing that sat there. Um, and finally, when I realized, oh, here's a generative idea. It could be a performance space, and there's always, you know, crowdsourcing content. There's always somebody local performing in it. And that once that idea came through the, you know, the train on the rooftop, then I knew it was going to work. So these are just some drawings, and you know, we used real wheels just to give you a sense of the scale. 
Uh, we used real wheels and tracks. Here it is being lifted up. They built it. It's perforated um, aluminum. The wheels and the tracks are real, but the boxcar they built, uh, Eldorado. Um, this is up six, six flights, and that's the prairie just starting out. Um, there it is before we put the words on it, which made a huge difference. Um, and we put some kind of crazy words on it that only I think Dan McGinn and I really know what it's about. But if you ever want to look on my website, I'm not going to take the time, but it, each one is a little bit, well, you know, load limit, a thousand clowns, things like that. Um, and then all the people who worked on it with some other jokes. And um, then it says Local Express. And when it's open, it's lighted, and it's a performance space. And they've been doing performances there every spring and summer and fall, um, sponsored by various agencies in, in Kansas City. It's just a nice gathering place. So that was a breakthrough, because I realized a performance space is also a generative crowdsourced thing, and it's like not so hard to make. <laughs> and in a way, in a way, it, the piece in Austin is a, is a space-making piece. It's not a performance space, but it's a space. Um, OK, how am I doing on time? Terrible? Uh, no, OK. Is it? OK, I'll quickly go through this one. This, was a, this is Mellon Park. This is a before picture in um, Pittsburgh. Uh, they were going to renovate the whole little park. Um, it's like a little pocket park within a bigger park. It's the walled garden within the larger Mellon Park. And um, a, a notable family in um, Pittsburgh had lost a daughter um, in um, 1999. And um, they wanted to make a memorial. So they were sort of sponsoring this to a certain extent. They've since become really good friends of mine. They're amazing people. Um, but. Uh, the public art agency said, this has to be a public piece that speaks to the public as well. So the challenge was, how do you make a memorial that's also a public piece? So with the help of Joe, the husband of the couple, um, we thought about stars. And we found the, the sky the day she was born, Annie Siemens was born. And we reflected that sky down into the well, so a lot of research and more spreadsheets. Um, each star has different names, it turns out. We consulted with an astronomer. I like doing research and I like learning new things, so I use all of these projects as a way to just learn stuff. Um, and so um, then we made these stones. We chose a name for each. When I say we, it's usually me and my studio assistants and other people involved in the projects. Um, and then chose a phrase for each one. And the phrases are either scientific or sort of poetic or a translation from either the Greek or Arabic, because the stars are often, or maybe, yeah, I think. Roman, Greek, Arabic. So um, you can look at some of those. Like two that look like one is just describing that it's a double star, things like that. Um, placed them, three different brightnesses, made the stones. Um, and then fiber optics underneath the, underneath the this was the cheapest way to do it. And actually, it's pretty robust because it's got four light sources. If I were to do it again now that LEDs are cheaper, I would probably do it that way. Um, there's Renee Paichaki, who is the public art manager. Each little thing has a, a place for the, the fiber optic and the stone. And we, we actually ha hand form those little tops to the light sticks because it gave the light out and spread out more. Testing it, testing it. Um, there's a little map. The name of the piece is that, those numbers at the top. That's like the time of day, the day. She was born in 1979. Um, and this, 
uh, latitude and longitude of the park and the opening and what it looks like and then what it looks like at night. It's kind of magical when you're there. It's very hard to capture. Um, that's another view from the... Okay, and I think this is the second of the last one I'll show you before the Austin piece. This is very recent. I installed this last summer. Um, I'm forgetting what year it is. Uh, yes, a year ago. Um, so this is, um, sorry, I was just trying to figure out when I did install this. Um, this is West Sacramento. Across the river is Sacramento. And West Sacramento, everyone thinks West Sacramento is part of Sacramento, but it's not. It's its own city. And so they wanted a piece that was kind of a, you know, let's make ourselves distinctive. Or maybe I decided that myself. I'm not sure. <laughs> there, there was... Um, there was this pier that they were planning on renovating, and then all these old pilings next to the pier. And interesting thing about the Sacramento River is that it rises and falls with the tide, even though it's in the middle of the state. And um, there's levees, and so it's always a different height. Um, so the piece in general is about orientation in two ways. We put this um, cantilevered platform out. The engineering of this was insane. Um, we built this so here was a case where I thought, let's do, let's make a sign that's like no other sign. And I thought, can you make a hol can you make really huge hollow letters? And a bunch of people said, no, it would never stand up. And finally, I found this amazing signage company um, uh, in um, in Oakland, who just did it. You know, so let's try it. And they did a test, and it worked. They figured out how to do it. So these letters really are hollow with the lighting on the inside they're covered with um, they're four feet tall you can't really well you can kind of see that with the guy underneath it they're four feet tall covered with five different kinds of metal that orangey one is copper and then we put bands on all the pilings there's 250 bands um, so there are these metal bands with the numbers the height of the water cut out um, I mean, to go through the process for this, it would take me about an hour to explain it to you because we did a LIDAR survey of the columns and then we did modeling of the bands and it turned out the bands had to be compound curves to be parallel, et cetera, et cetera. But to make it, see how the bands have to be compound curves, you guys over there? Um, <laughs> so they all had to be put on one by one and these amazing guys did it. and. Um, there's just a, a reference to the band on one of the letters. That's just a GIF I made. It doesn't turn this off, and it turns, it's got a motor. It turns once every 15 minutes and uh, faces downtown Sacramento just to say hello for about two minutes, and then it comes back. So the idea is that it's facing West Sacramento, and if you're on the other side, you read it, you see it backwards. So it, it puts the subject of the story in West Sacramento. And then every 15 minutes, it'll say hello to downtown Sacramento. Um, that's it at night. OK, and finally, this is a rendering of a piece that led to, I promise, this is the last one before Austin. Um, this is going to be installed in two weeks. Um, this is a, just a SketchUp rendering, three renderings. Um, the reason I'm showing this is this idea led to the Austin idea. About three years ago, I was commissioned to make a piece in Seattle um, in a little pocket park uh, in the middle of the new Amazon campus, um, just downtown <sighs> Seattle. And I sort of thought, oh, let's, you know, it's at the corner. Honestly, I thought I've never made anything on a stick. Why don't I make something on a stick if I'm going to be totally honest? Um, <laughs> but I probably shouldn't say that out loud. I just thought, like, people always make public art that's, like, up on sticks. I'm going to do it, too. But um, because it's right at the corner of all these intersections, so you just see it. And um, it's a bus blind, like the old-fashioned. I don't have a picture of that. But you know the, the London buses that scroll and scroll and scroll? So I thought, well, what could it say? This is sort of my thought process, this thing, this sign on a stick. Um, and my thought was, well, you know, there are all these people who work at Amazon, computer people, 
there's some schools around. What about destinations from literature? And um, it's kind of funny how it works so interestingly here and there. It's going to be in a cool way, kind of like, what? Uh, <laughs> you know, a little bit more of a, what is this? So, you know, one day it might say Middle Earth, and the next day it might say Trelfamador. Um, so it's kind of renaming the park every day. One of them is facing outward, and one of them is facing inward. So the outward one are a hundred different places, fictional destinations from adult literature, comics, etc. And the one facing inward is um, children's literature and etc. Um, because there's a little children's park inside. Um, it's lighted. I'll show you the. Uh, okay. So then I started making these spreadsheets, which then led to the Austin piece. Um, all the fictional places. Uh, let's see. So the year, uh, the name of the place, like Arrakis comes from, I can't really read it, from who the author is. Maybe you can. Oh, like, like um, the little prince is one, asteroid B something something where the author is from, because we were trying to get it to be a bit you know, more diverse, which I think we've succeeded in. Um, and then the building of it. So some engineers in Florida put together the existing scrolling bus blind um, and then put some computer stuff on it. And aluminum fabricators in Milwaukee built the cases for it. And we're going to go up to, then the exciting part is going to Seattle in a week and a half and seeing, like, well, this looks like it's going to work. <laughs> OK, so, so that idea then, the idea of the fictional destinations kind of naturally transferred over to an airport. And that piece is called um, Escape Destinations. And the piece for Austin your airport is called Interimaginary Departures. It's got its own logo. Um, and um, it says on here, design iteration number, you know, question mark, because it's gone through so many design iterations um, till now when we're starting fabrication. Um, so the, I, here are some things that influence the design. Um, this piece across the disciplines is a sculpture that I made in 1990. So I was thinking about like things intersecting other things. Um, I was thinking about making this hold room that's going to sending you to other fictional destinations. Um, that there might be a fictional hold room that's dropped down into your airport. Um, so that, tech, that sort of formally, you know, my own piece sort of inspired me. This book by China Mieville, The City in the City, is a wonderful science fiction book. If you're going to read one science fiction book, I recommend that one. Um, it's about two cities in Eastern Europe that are on top of each other, basically. They're intersecting each other. And if you live in one, you don't see the other. And if you live in the other, you don't see the other. Because you've been trained not to see the people. And it's got a kind of political slant to it. You've sort of been trained not to see the other people. It's really great. Um, other things that influenced me, these books on the left, a, a couple um, uh, source reference books for imaginary places, just to broaden the list of imaginary places. Upper right, um, the last scene in 2001, um, the movie that all other films have been influenced by visually, so I thought certainly had to have that. And then the very bottom, um, this motif of three rabbits, three ears, um, which I had seen, uh, I saw it in China in a Buddhist cave. I saw it in Egypt. I've just seen, accidentally seen that motif a number of times, so you'll see that's going to pop into the thing too. So this is just a little grab bag of things that influenced it. Um, then references from the airport itself, there's a departure board up in the upper right. Um, so we're going to have a departure board to fictional locations. Uh, in the bottom, remember that picture, because I'm sure you've been to the airport, but see the rows of benches and the gray carpet. So we're going to drop another room 
right onto those chairs. Um, then lower left, the little block with the six on it, remember that, because that's going to that's be the chandelier. Um, so now, okay, so fictional hold room has been inserted at a slight angle into the existing hold room of the airport. It appears that flights leave from this hold room from fictional locations found in literature to, should say two fictional locations found in literature, film, and other media. Visiting the room, the room you can sit, you can receive a boarding pass by way of a touch screen. You can see what flights are coming up, read about details of current destination. You will also hear original music and am amusing boarding announcements for upcoming flights. Um, so here's an overview with a little beam of sunshine shining on it. Um, now, it's hard to read this. Uh, can you read it? Um, there's a carpet with the rabbits. You're looking down at it. There's the existing chairs. There's a room with walls that's on a seven degree tilt. So it's as if that room has dropped in. There are red chairs. I'm going to show you more of this and some close-ups. There's some bronze tables. There's some, I wonder if we can just put a little piece of cardboard somewhere where that beam is so you can see better. Oh, actually just a, <laughs> stand there and block the light. Everything's 3D. You're going to see in a second. Yes. Um, hang on. And he <laughs> Is he standing in front of it? That's pretty good. Almost. Not bad. Come up to the railing. Come up to the railing. You'll be bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yay. Woo. OK, now you can see it. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Um, then. There's going to be a ceiling on top of the other ceiling also that's also a sort of coffered ceiling that's also um, on that angle. So that'll orient you too that you're in this kind of room on top of a room. But here's a view that gives you a little better idea. Um, so on the, um, okay, so the red, I think we can, can I zoom in? I was able to zoom in. Um, let's just try this, Corey did this, but I don't know if it works. Yeah, I don't know if it works in, on a Mac. On Mac World. Um. Oh, fine. Funny, right? Right. Well, I've got close-ups. That's OK. Um, I wonder. No. OK. So over here, you're in the regular airport. There's no wall between it um, on, the, on the right. Then there's the three rows of regular chairs, one of which takes a while to just take this in, uh, one of which is coming through the wall. Um, the red chairs have just been dropped into the other chairs. The garbage can over on the left is sticking through the wall. Um, on the left, the black uh, is a video monitor. That's the FIDS board, so it's going to be moving and telling you different destinations. On the right, that's the two plate. Might show two different destinations that are coming up. Out of the chandelier, this is missing the the ceiling. Out of the chandelier are going to be the audio announcements. Um, that television in the middle of the wall is just oriented normally, but it's sticking through the wall and it's going to be playing like CNN, but it's just coming through, right? So certain things are from the airport, like the black chairs. The garbage can, the television are from the airport. Anything else? And the stanchions, which I have a close-up of. <laughs> and the other things are dropped in. Glad this is getting a laugh. <laughs> oh, what happened? OK, I feel like I'm missing an image. But um, am I? Yeah. Um, if you go over to the side, this is sort of eye level. And it's got a different carpet. It's got an old version of the carpet. But there's a glass. This is the niche that you can look in to the back behind. Um, so you see the flipper that's coming out that says which gate it is, and the wall. And there's the touch screen over there. But these are the chairs at the back. So you're kind of looking behind the scenes. And that's the garbage can poking out. And there's a glass wall in front of it. Um, and there's the television poking through the wall. 
Um, upper right, there's the chandelier with the announcements. There's one of the chairs. The chairs are bronze. Everything's bronze. And this is the big challenge for Blue Genie, bronze and leather or pleather or something. And um, there's a beam of light that's coming between the doors. So if you were to walk up to the stanchions, there's a beam of light there, but the doors don't open. You know, taking you to the beyond. Here's the stanchions and the and the ticket dispenser, also bronze, but you see the stanchions from the regular airport, and then they're intersected on the seven degree angle with our bronze stanchions. And then that over in the upper left is the ticket dispenser. So there's a touch screen at the bottom. Now what's to keep, someone asked this today, what's to keep people from just getting ticket after ticket after ticket is that it's gonna take five minutes to answer all the questions on that touch screen. That hasn't been designed yet, and then you get a ticket. Um, and there's some other little Easter eggs on that thing. That, and these are the tickets. These are designed by the boarding passes. Um, these are just the first versions. Um, these, this great designer, Tom Kufel, um, who's retired, lives in New York. He designed these. Um, so they will have a quote from the book. They'll have your destination. Um, they'll have interimaginary departures. They'll have the airline. He's invented some airlines like Ars Longa. He came up with one recently, um, um, Air Linguist, um, <laughs> Gus America. He's going to come up with some more. Um, and then a picture. So we're going to do 100 to 130 of these. Um, Molly and Eric, you're coming up soon. Your role in this is coming up soon. <laughs> um, uh, OK. We have some Texas writers in there. Texas writers. I think we have some Texas writers in there, actually. Can't swear to it. Uh, Kurt said that, too, you know? Kurt had one. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, um, there's a video game that's. And there's, a, and there's also a place called New Austin from something. What's that from? Yeah, that's the Red Dead Redemption is one of the fictional places. And New Austin is a place that's set in a fictional version of Texas. So right, right. <laughs> OK. And there's another Texas something. Anyway, this is a close-up of the, you know, remember, this is a rendering, so it's not going to look exactly like the thing. But um, the chair and the, the, the feet of the chairs have claws. Um, there's tables between the chairs that have lights. Um, yeah, there's the three designers. Um, so the FIDS board will, I was saying today, there's going to be some that are canceled, some flights that are canceled because the world has ended in one of the books or various, various things. So, but you get a few of the places. Um, so then the, so here's the crowdsourcing. Um, researchers from book people, bookstore and University of Texas at Austin graduate departments of English and School of Information are being commissioned to find quotes, facts, and to write the boarding announcements. So um, people like Molly Roy and Eric Pitty here have been working. And any, anyone else from he worked on this? Um, here's some, here are the folders um, of people who've worked on it. Um, so you know, more spreadsheets, more lists. Um, but Molly and Eric have read, I can't imagine how they've read so many books. It just seems impossible um, for this. It's crazy. Uh, here's some of the charts. So you see they put their names on a lot of them. And you know, all those people did, did some, including me. Here's one that Eric did. I'm sorry, like I was doing this fast, and I realized, oh, this might be like your, not your most inventive one. But honestly, they're so inventive, it's crazy. So he finds a, they find a quotation. That's going to be for the ticket. So there's the quotation. And the quotations are always about travel in some way. So this was probably an easier one because it's you know some place where there isn't any trouble, blah, blah, blah. And then mode of transportation. These are going to be, these next three things will be, um, or three or four or five things will be on the board to the right, like mode of transportation, a pair of ruby slippers, distance from Austin, somewhere over the rainbow, duration of flight. It's got that. I can't read it. Um, the weather, the weather, atmosphere, the environment, et cetera. And then the departure announcement, which we'll, we'll get to attention passengers en route to the Emerald City, et cetera. 
Um, but I'm going to show you more of those. Um, I put this up. Molly did the one on the right, and I did the one on the left. These are just the beginnings of each, but mine was so easy. It was from Invisible Cities by Calvino, and it's just like there was an obvious quote, like, why come to Trude, I asked myself. It says, you can resume your flight whenever you like, they said to me, but you will arrive at another Trude, absolutely the same, detail by detail. The world is covered by a sole trude, which does not begin and does not end. Only the name of the airport changes. That's just perfect. Um, but then I reread Pride and Prejudice, and I could not find a quote at all. I don't know if you know this, that I did. And I couldn't find anything. And then you found this perfect quote. <laughs> so um, yeah, oops, did I lose this? Um, so they're awesome. And then the audio announcements, these are some, and you might want to just read some. I don't know which of these you two wrote, but probably a lot of them. So people will recognize some, like if you've read the you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you're going to recognize, put a fish in your ear and don't panic. But if you haven't, you know, <laughs> you won't. <laughs> um, so Steve Parker is the launch pad artist for this project. He's not here. He's out of town. But he is going to write original music and then get voice actors to read all of these. There'll be probably, again, 100 to 130 different ones. And they'll be coordinated with what's on the board. And they'll be quiet enough not to disturb anyone in the rest of the airport, but loud enough to alarm people. No. <laughs> um, and that's the end. OK. Thank you. It feels like your ideas you know, conceptually happen as you develop the project. Yeah. And yet, the commissioning into students, not just this one for Austin, but several of the ones that you showed us, um, how, you know, how, much is, how much is there at the beginning when they're commissioned? And how much does the, the entity that's, you know, that's creating, you know, that's hiring, you're, right, that's commissioning them, it's like, how much do they trust you? How much do they have in hand? How much do you tell them? How, how well, much? Because so much is at what point? At the point where they say yes and hire and basically give you the the project. Well, because there's also at the beginning. You understand there's a proposal and then and, and there's a point with some entities because they've got teams and other people that are not able to make the leap. Right. How, how, how do you handle that? Have you applied for public art? Project and found that yes. issue? Yeah. Yes. So there's two kinds of calls for public art. There's the kind where they say, well, actually, there's three. There's RFPs, which nobody does anymore, requests for proposals, where a lot of people send in proposals and they pick one. But there's this other kind um, that's requests for qualifications. They choose three to five people. They give you a month. They say, come in, show us your proposal. and um, then we're going to pick one. Now, I've applied over the many years I've applied for those. I never win those. I can't come up with an idea that fast without having been in the place. So now I just, you know, in the beginning I applied for those, but I just don't anymore because I think when you start you kind of have to because um, they want to trust that you're, they're going to get something from you, but I can't think that fast. So I usually come up with a bad idea, and then I come up with a better idea, and then I come up with an even better idea. So I apply to the ones where they say, request for qualifications, we're going to choose someone based on an interview and your past work, um, because I can't do the other kind. Now, some people make similar things all the time, and so, or have a, you know, a, a type of work or a mural style or something, so they can make a proposal. I have a lot of friends who do murals, and they make proposals, and they win the competition. 
But for me, getting the idea is the hardest part. So I need to go to the place, look at it. I don't know how long it took to get this, but about a year, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it took a while. Um, and, you know, and then it changed and changed and changed again. Um, so the people who hire me just, ha you know, what I always say, what they say in the contract, honestly, is they say, if we don't like your proposal, you have to come up with something else. So I have a commission now in Cleveland. Um, interestingly, a small commission, and I took it because I really like dogs, and it's for their kennel. And, <laughs> and um, I made a proposal, and they didn't like it. And so I said, okay, I'll, you know, I was very disappointed because I liked it a lot. And I said, okay, I'll, do an, I'll think of something else. Um, so it's not that they're stuck with whatever I give them, but it does have to go through some iterations and some thinking. It just takes a while. It's helpful to hear you describe the struggle because yeah. I kept thinking I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. No. You mean you've applied with a proposal? No, 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 I've gotten projects, but there's always this intense desire to, to, to have this thing that looks like it's finished. And you're... Yeah. How can you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Super. And then even when it's finished like this, there's still things that develop with the fabricator and, you know, as it's going. Yeah. Hi, Jenna. So nice to meet you in person. Nice to meet you, too. So I wanted to ask what draws you to, because I also saw a through line in a lot of these projects is um, this collectivism, like you, you draw people to you, people with very specific sets of skills and and it, it multiplies the effort and it and it changes it and, and in a lot of these cases it materializes it like in machinery and, and colors and, and different languages. And I was just wondering like how did you how do you see yourself developing in that line and what draws you to bring more people in and make the the process so technical and, and require such skilled labor as well. I don't even know the answer to that question, but it's inter it's an interesting question. It's just true. Um, I mean, the the content building, it just makes it so much both harder and easier for me because, like the Minneapolis, all those videos and audios, I could not have made. You know, I I realized I wanted to make these mechanical things, but it had to have content, and it had to have Minnesota specific content. But to make hundreds of videos or to make make something that would fill that space wouldn't be feasible. And then I thought, you know, I did think like crowdsourcing, bring, bring Minnesota talent into it. It's just more than the sum of its parts, like way more. Um, so, you know, if everybody's credited, especially in that, like each video is credited, um, then it gives a showcase to other people and it just makes the whole thing much more complicated. But, you know, the funny, I, I've also always been drawn to mechanical and digital combinations in, in my sculpture. Um, but at one point, my studio assistant some years back said, have you ever noticed that everything you make has a million parts? And, and I, I honestly had never noticed it. Um, <laughs> but it does. Even when I'm trying not to, it still does. Um, like, I sort of thought this, didn't ha this Austin piece didn't have a million parts, but it does. So. I don't know, I just kind of go over the board. I'm very excited that you're doing a piece influenced by Mieville because I love his stuff. And oh, okay. um, I love the city and the city, and I try to describe it, and it's like, whoa, people are like, I don't get it. And now I can just say, go to the Austin Airport. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they made a BBC movie out of it. They did? It's a, it's a four part series, I think. Wow, it's okay. Well, now I know how to spend a lot of hours. Yeah. With um, but I'm curious if you like people, like we know the influence because you're giving this talk, but do you by other means display your influences in your pieces? Like will there be something in, Aust in the airport that says like, oh, this no, is... No, but okay. I am going to put not the city, in, well now that you mention it, maybe I'll put the city and the city on the stack. We're going to, you know, in that niche that you're looking in, we're going to put a bookshelf that's sort of like a sideways bookshelf with a stack of reference books on it. Okay. And so it'll have all the books that are the reference books used to get the um, names of the places. And maybe I'll put the city and the city in there too. And um, Kim had this, was it Kim or Chris had this really cool idea to 
make the bottom book that is the shelf the plaque for the piece and list all the people who worked on it, um, which is kind of brilliant. Yeah, so there's that. <coughs> Thanks. I think I'll put the city in the city on that stack. That's a really good idea. And someone who knows it will say, whoa, you know, and like, they'll, you okay. will, anyway. <laughs> Thank you to Texas Society of Architects for hosting us again tonight. And um, thank you, Janet, for speaking to us tonight. It's great.